All right, so in this second uh, video in the series, we're going to look at the general process that we use to perform machine learning. So what inputs do we need? What outputs are we going to get? What type of pre-processing needs to be performed? Um, this stuff isn't maybe exciting, but it's very important because you've got to get your data in the right format in order to feed it into these uh, learning algorithms. All right, so this is the general process that we follow in order to do uh, prediction from training samples. So you're trying to pr predict something. So there's something that you want to predict. And you don't actually know what that, the values of that thing in your area, but you have other information that might help you predict it. So um, you're going to have a set of variables that you think are correlated or could potentially use to predict the thing you're interested in. So in this example, I'm trying to predict the likelihood that a, there will be a landslide at a location. So as input, I have points that represent where there are landslides and then other points where there aren't landslides. And then I also have exam some variables that I think could be helpful in making that prediction. So things like uh, soil types, soil wetness conditions, topographic characteristics, geologic characteristics. So we basically have that information at each of these locations and we can feed that into an algorithm. So the algorithm has examples in this case of, of conditions at slope failure locations and conditions at non-slope failure locations. And from that data, it can learn patterns and create a model. So that becomes our trained model. And then once we have a trained model, then we can use it to make predictions. So we could, for example, pre predict back to a validation set to assess how well the model did or we could predict to the entire extent of the study area or to try to add every single pixel location to create a map. So again, the inputs are basically going to be sample locations or training samples, predictor variables that are going to help us understand this thing that we're trying to predict. Those will be used to create a model for, or an, sorry, will be fed into an algorithm, which will then be create a model, which we can then apply to new data. Okay, so here's kind of an overview of the process I tend to go through if I'm working on a spatial predictive model in particular. So you need to have training data, so it could be points or polygons or pixels, but you have to have some examples of the, th of the thing that you're trying to predict, uh, because again, this is a supervised process. Then you have to develop some predictor variables, and what you'll use as predictor variables will dep it depends on what it is you're actually trying to predict predict and the type of output that you want. Um, you also should have some validation data. So this is data that the algorithm hasn't seen that you can then feed it to see how well it does. Um, you can't really validate on the data that the model was trained on. We'll talk about that uh, uh, later. Um, and then we'll, you'll need to prepare the data and, and bring it into R so it needs to be in the correct format. You, could, you do any pre-processing or optimization that needs to be ran, so optimizing the algorithm, again prepping the data. Then you can run and create a model, and then you can use that model to predict to some validation data, and then create a validated model, and then you can also predict out to all of your samples, for example, an entire spatial extent, like every polygon or every point or every pixel, whatever your unit is, and then you can save those results and obviously report on them and create an output for the people who can hopefully use. Okay, so here's some key characteristics of training data. So because we're dealing with making maps over map space, your training data should be spatially explicit, which means you should know where it occurs. So for example, um, in this uh, image, this is a Sentinel-2 image over Vancouver in British Columbia, all these polygons represent training samples. So they occur at a, at a specific, or occur or are over a specific area um, in the map space they should be representative of the population. So, for example, if you were trying to predict like tree types, uh, or the habit, so let's say the habitat of a specific tree, and that tree grows in floodplains and also on side slopes. If you only give the algorithm examples of side slopes, it's not going to know that it could grow in the floodplain and it'll be a biased model. So you have to represent the population well. And one way to do that is to use ran is to incorporate randomness into your sampling. You have to have an adequate number of samples. Um, the number of samples you need, it's hard to 
actually put a hard number on that because it depends on the complexity of the problem, the number of input variables, um, the you know, how you know how differentiable the things you're trying to separate are. Um, so that's kind of a case specific uh, issue. You also should have an adequate number of samples per category. So if you give the computer a thousand examples of land cover types, but you only give it th only three of those examples are, say, herbaceous areas, then that might not be enough information for it to understand that specific class. And then obviously they need to be accurate. So it's a garbage in, garbage out situation. So if you um, give if you give the computer mislabeled data, it's going to have a hard time learning from that. So I think the most important component of any um, predictive modeling process in a supervised context is that you have to g produce and develop a quality training data um, so the computer can learn from good examples. Um, just as a side note, um, sometimes we're, we get into a situation where the model requires both examples of the thing you're interested in and examples of not the thing you're interested in. So for example, if you're trying to map wetlands, you would want to have examples of wetlands and examples of not wetlands. But it's not always common that we collect not type data. So for example, if you're an ecologist, then you, you may only have data on where people found a specific organism. You might not have examples of where they didn't find it. Um, so if you require both presence and absence data and you don't have absence data, you may have to develop what we call pseudo-absence data. So these could be random locations that you think are unlikely to have that thing present. Um, there are some modeling methods that either don't need these or they kind of create them as background points um, um, in, the pro in the modeling process, such as maximum entropy models. Um, so I just wanted to note that if you run into that situation, you're going to have to come up with a means to produce absence data um, from the landscape that, you, that aren't available in the data set. Then you're going to need to have some predictor variables. And because we are wanting to predict out to a map space, we need to have those variables at every location on the map, in, in the map space so that we have a continuous map when we're done. So that means that your, your, um, your predictor variables also need to be spatially explicit. So you need to know where they occur. Um, they should be accurately georeferenced, right? So the positional errors in the data don't have a really negative impact on the model. Again, they should be accurate and precise. You know, if your data um, have errors in them, that error is going to kind of get compounded into the model in some weird nonlinear way, which is hard to maybe quantify. Uh, timeliness can matter in some situations and maybe not others. So if you were, say, need ex information like bedrock geology, that might not be that important um, because it doesn't change that fast, in or important that it's timely, um, whereas some things can change very rapidly, like um, demographics or something. Um, adequate spatial resolution. So if you're trying to produce a model that shows very subtle changes on the landscape, you might need to have data that's at a high spatial resolution, like a one or two meter pixel. There are some types of data that are not always easy to find at a high spatial resolution. So things like weather and climate information. Um, in the modern, with modern spatial data, we, it's generally pretty easy to find you know, sub 10 meter elevation data, like for example, LIDAR data sets and high resolution imagery, um, quality vector data that could be rasterized but um, there are some, some gaps. Um, generally, we can't have everything that we want, so you've just got to find what's available, and then for things that are maybe not great, you can decide whether to include them anyway or to leave them out or modify them in some way. It might be that you actually have to collect some more data to actually do the modeling that you want. And then lastly, they all obviously need to be available, right? So. Um, a lot of times we assume that data exists without actually going to look for it. And then once we actually do try to find it, we realize that it's really not something we can get our hands on. Um, and that can be problematic, especially if it was a key part of your modeling process or a key predictor variable. So it's good to explore and see what data is available before you get into this process. You may find that you have enough to work with, or you might have to augment something, or you might have to try to actually create some new raw data. Okay, so we've, t we've talked about this already, so I'm not going to um, belabor this, but we're going to mainly work on predicting on top of raster grids 
um, in the later sections. So you should be familiar with how to get your raster data into, into R. Um, so just a quick review of that. Again, those raster, geospatial raster data can be read in using the raster package. Um, single band rasters are generally read in with the raster function. If you have a multi-band file or multiple files that you'd like to associate, you can use stack or brick. Uh, brick only works on a, it has to be referenced to a single object, whereas a, a, a stack can reference multiple files or even individual, a subset of bands from one file. If you are just working with a single object, it's generally a good idea to, um, to read it as a brick as that should be computationally more efficient than reading it as a stack. If it's coming in with mul from multiple files or a subset of files, you're going to probably have to use a stack. Um, I still like to do a lot of my pre-processing outside of R um, in a GIS environment, like using ArcGIS. So I tend to produce my predictor variables and stack them and whatnot in R's, or in ArcGIS as opposed to R, but that's really just personal preference. Um, some raster prep uh, um, comments, and again, you should be familiar with this if you're a GIS professional, so let's mention these quickly. You may have to extract out pieces of larger data sets to feed into your model. So you can do that with operations such as extract by mask or extract by polygon or whatnot, extract by point at point locations. So you may need to subset out data prior to bringing it into R to model on top of. Um, you may also need to do the opposite, which would be take smaller files and merge them together. And that could be accomplished with mosaicing processes such as mosaic to new raster. So for example, you might have a set of elevation grids for your extent that are separate files, and you need to convert, con, um, merge them into a single um, extent, or, or a single file to use in the modeling. You may also need to stack your data. So if you have a bunch of individual layers, you could stack them up into a multi-band file. Uh, we commonly think about this in the context of multi-band imagery, like a Landsat scene or something. But you can actually stack multiple types of raster grids into a, a single multi-layer file. So for example, if you produce a lot of terrain variables from an, an elevation surface, you could stack those into a multi-band raster grid to feed into, the, the, um, to feed into R. I generally prefer to do it this way because R is not as forgiving in, in regards to um, different extents and origins and number of cells and rows and columns than, say, ArcGIS is. So if you stack your data before bringing them into R, then they're automatically going to have the same extent and cell size and, uh, because they are basically they're, they're the same file. So I prefer to do that outside of R uh, personally, but again, there are tools to do these types of things in R. Um, and then one other side note about this is when you do stack files, they generally have to be the same pixel type. So if you have a bunch of like 8-bit grids and, a, and, then a, and then a float grid, they're all going to have to be converted to float. So they're all the same data type. Or you'd have to somehow alter the float grid to, to an 8-bit grid. Um, so this could have a fairly large impact on file size. Okay, so you also need to validate your model. So again, you can't validate your model on the, mo on the data it was trained on because, again, it does what's called overfitting. So again, what that means is that it's going to do a better job at predicting things it's already seen than new things. So just seeing how well it does on the training data doesn't really tell you how well the model will generalize to new situations or new data, which is really the whole point of making the model to begin with. So in short, we need to come up with validation data that uh, are separate from our training data. So in order to get a real representation of the accuracy of the model, the data should be unbiased. So for example, if you're mapping um, land cover types, as in this example, you could just pick points that are really good examples of each land cover type. But obviously, the landscape is also going to include more fuzzy or complicated examples. So if you're not including those, you're artificially inflating the accuracy of your, of your product. Um, one way to make data unbiased is to randomize it. So in this example, I just generated a bunch of random points across the extent using a, a random number generator. There's some available in R and also like an ARC and other GIS software packages. And then I went into each of those points and then labeled it to a land cover class. Again, they shouldn't overlap with your training data. They should be separate. And again, that's because um, 
the algorithm is biased, it, it, or generally over fits to the training data, so if you include that in the validation, it can inflate your accuracy and be non-representative of the true accuracy of your, of your product. Um, this is something not everybody does, and there's some debate over this, but correctly proportioned means that if, say, you're doing a, a classification problem, you should represent the proportions on the landscape. So if only 20% of the area is grass or herbaceous, then 20% of your data points should be grass or herbaceous as opposed to more or less than that. Um, full randomization can will should approximate that because the percentage of the area is directly related to the likelihood of it being selected, um, a, a pixel in that class being selected. Um, however, there are a lot of complexities with this. So for example, if you have a class that is very, um, a, you know, a very small proportion of your landscape, then if you do a random sample, you might not get that many samples. So that's a tricky problem, and we do, we, it's something we have to deal with when we work in map space and you know, for things like remote sensing classification. And then lastly, they should be accurate. So in remote sensing and geospatial sciences, we try not to use the term ground truth anymore because ground truth implies that it's fact but all data are going to have some error associated with them. So instead, we talk about things like validation or test data. So the assumption is that they're much more accurate than the map that you, or the, uh, the prediction that you're trying to assess, but they're probably not 100% right. So tr quality training data and quality validation data are key in this process. So here's just some thoughts on how I like to prep my training data. So I like to do this, um, the, do this out in an, in outside of R, like in ArcGIS or a GIS software package. So for example, I can generate a bunch of points, and then at those points, I can summarize my data um, using things like extracted point or extract extract at multiple points or zonal statistics or tabulate area. And then from that, I prep a table and read that table into R to train on top of. And then to predict back, I just, I generally will um, uh, read in the, the, the geospatial data and predict on top of it. So here's some tools that you might find useful for developing training data. So zonal statistics is table. You, it could be used to extract statistical information from grids within the area of polygons or, at, or along line segments. So if you're, your training and validation units are polygons, you could summarize your predictor variables um, using zonal statistics as table. If you wanted to summarize categorical data, then you could do that with tabulate area. So that would return back a, a land area of each category by zone. So here we have land cover types per county. And then with some table manipulation and math, you could convert those into proportions or percentages if you wanted. And if you're trying to extract values at points, the um, extract raster values at points and or extract multi-raster values at points tools can be used to accomplish that. So in this example, I have some points, and I'm tr extracting the elevation and the land cover values at those points, and those will get added to the table. You could then export that table out. Or, or you could read it in as a shapefile or a feature class into R and to de for further develop the training set. Okay, so this is the end of the second section. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, in the next section or video, I'm going to talk about doing these types of uh, predictive processes in R or in Carrot specifically. So I'll see you in the next video.